to start, let's we use up all of our time and um, introduce our speaker. Marie Hertzfeld comes to us from the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University in Minnesota. She's professor of science and religion, and she teaches there both computer science and theology. She has degrees from St. Olaf's College in um, computer science and music, and from Penn State in mathematics and computer science, and a PhD in theology from the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley. Her areas of interest, very wide reaching, um, scan artificial intelligence and the human spirit, computer technology and Christian theology, spiritual traditions of Islam, and religion in conflict. She's the author of Technology and Religion, Remaining Human in a Co-Created World, and most recently, The Limits of Perfection in Technology, Religion, and Science. And numerous articles I have found um, very interesting, her article on Srebrenica and um, the um, dangers of religious nationalism and reconciliation between um, various religious groups in, in um, Bosnia. Um, as a Quaker with a Lutheran background, teaching in a Catholic college, <laughs> she has a unique perspective to bring on this interreligious dialogue and with her training on uh, religious dialogue and technology. She's going to speak to us today on cybernetic enhancement and the problem of the self. So join me in welcoming Marie Herzfeld. Hello, as you can tell from the introduction, I am both a professional student and a one-woman ecumenical movement. Um, and I also was rather surprised when Leslie asked me to be one of your plenary speakers at this conference on biotechnology as a computer science. I mean, I got the technology part, but I'm going, um, bio? Uh, you know, this is kind of the anti-bio side. Um, but as I thought a little more about the topic, I realized that as we look towards the future, particularly as we listen to the predictions of certain futurists, certain scientists, particularly in the fields of artificial intelligence, um, they are saying, well, you know, biotechnology is all about, in Silicon Valley parlance, hacking the body. And the ultimate hack, of course, is to get rid of the body completely. Get rid of the bio part and simply live in cyberspace. And many of us are already cybernetically enhanced. Francis Collins sort of beat me to this, but how many of you are wearing one of these? Okay, you're cybernetically enhanced. Oh, I didn't see too many hands go up, so let's try something else. How many of you have got one of these in your pocket? Yeah, all the hands go up on that one. Um, so cybernetic enhancement is already with us. Um, we can say, well, it can go further steps towards implants. Um, it can go even further towards uh, things like Francis Collins mentioned twice last night, the idea of uploading the brain. Um, we're actually going to jump out to the farthest reaches and take a look at that question of uploading the brain. Uh, and then we'll kind of work our way back, you know, from the uh, science fiction sort of future to more the present of where we are now. So when we think about this question of enhancement, underlying it are some very important religious questions. What is the nature of the soul, or what is the nature of the self? And obviously, different religious traditions have taken a different viewpoint on this. There's the idea that we have an inter eternal soul that is embodied in this particular body, maybe for one go-round in the Judeo-Christian tradition, maybe for multiple go-rounds if you're a Hindu and believe in reincarnation. Um, there's the idea that the self is emergent. That, in other words, we aren't necessarily born with a self, but it emerges through the narrative of our lives. 
Um, there's also the question of whether our self is a wholly individual thing or whether we're really only selves within a community. And then finally, there are the whole different questions of the relationship of the self to the mind and to the body. Now, it raises a question. When you have futurists or artificial intelligence people like Ray Kurzweil, who are basically ready to jettison the body and say the self is really just the mind, do bodies matter? Well, the first thing I would like to suggest is that we live in a time that answers this question, do bodies matter, in a very schizophrenic way. Okay, first of all, we've got the whole diet industry, which is in 2017, a $169 billion industry. Um, in 2017, 17 and a half million of us underwent cosmetic surgery. Um, if you look at a graph of, you know, how these things are selling, it's really an exponential curve. So bodies do seem to matter to us a great deal, but at the same time, we live a different part of our lives, uh, at least probably um, your children, for some of you, your grandchildren are living a very different part of their lives in a disembodied world online, in cyberspace, uh, as you play video games, um, as you have an avatar, or even for many of us just as the persona that we make up and project in social media. Um, as virtual reality comes online, this will give us another venue in which the body won't matter in the same way that we will see ourselves the way we wish to project ourselves in cyberspace. And many authors have waxed very poetic about this kind of projection. Let me just um, read a few to you. Um, first we have uh, Nicole Stenger who, well let's go first to Neil Stevenson in his novel Snow Crash. He writes, if you're ugly you can make your avatar beautiful. If you've just gotten out of bed, your avatar can still be wearing beautiful clothes and professionally applied makeup. You can look like a gorilla or a dragon or even a giant talking penis. Okay. Nicole Stenger goes further, more towards the picture on the bottom, and says, cyberspace grafts a new nature of reality on our everyday life. It opens up an infinity of space in an eternity of light. On the other side of data gloves, we become creatures of colored light in motion, pulsing with golden particles. We will be, as in our dreams, everything. An interesting viewpoint. So from that viewpoint, there's the idea that, well, maybe bodies don't matter so much. Um, so let's think first about this question. Could we upload our minds? and live in cyberspace full time. Okay, um, this is a dream of many futurists, many computer scientists have looked at that. The computer scientist Danny Hillis says, I like my body just as much as anybody else, but if I could live to 200 in a body of silicon, I'd take it. Um, Ray Kurzweil uh, goes a bit further, and we'll get to him in a minute. Um, Let's look at this question about uploading our brain with four questions of our own. First question, why would we want to do this? Do we want to do this? Second question, how close are we to being able to do this? Third question, what does Christianity have to say about this? And then our fourth question, well, you know, uh, how about maybe if we just do it part-time? <laughs> okay? So... Let's take a look at our, wait, wait, before we take a look at our first question, uh, some underlying questions to just keep in the back of your mind underneath this. First of all, is this a new dualism? Are we returning back to the ideas of Rene Descartes, who basically said, you know, I think, therefore I am. It's only the mind that matters. Secondly, can the mind be separated? from the body? Is it possible to have a mind? This is a question that underlies not just these questions of you know, transhumanism and brain uploading, 
but the whole field of artificial intelligence. Can you have a mind that is not in a living body? And then secondly, where is the locus of ourself? Until now, our minds and our bodies have always been connected, and so we find ourselves in both of them. But what's going to happen if we find out that we really can disconnect our mind from our body? Okay, so question one, why would we want to live in cyberspace? I think we've already, in a way, covered that. Okay, first you have the gorgeous avatar. Hey, you know, who wouldn't want to be able to look perfect, you know, instead of in, with the imperfections we have? Our bodies are imperfect. And for some people, the imperfections are much more of a difficulty, you know, than for others. Um, for someone like Stephen Hawking, uh, wouldn't it be nice to maybe get out of a disabled body and, and be um, a bit freer. Um, and then, of course, we die. And we have to face the mortality of these human bodies. And if we could separate ourselves from a mortal body, would that be a new avenue to immortality? Well, Ray Kurzweil thinks so. And so he writes, up until now, our mortality was tied to the longevity of our hardware. But when the hardware crashed, that was it. For many of our forebears, the hardware gradually deteriorated before it disintegrated. As we crossed the divide to instantiate ourselves into our computational technology, our identity will be based on our evolving mind file. We will be software, not hardware. As software, our mortality will no longer be dependent on the survival of computing circuitry, as we periodically port ourselves to the latest, ever more capable, personal, very personal, computer. Our immortality will be a matter of being sufficiently careful to make frequent backups. <laughs> it always reminds me of uh, an old computer science joke, you know, that Jesus and the devil were having a computing contest uh, to see who could write the best code. Maybe they were coding human beings, who knows. Um, so anyway, they're both typing away and typing away and typing away and typing away. And, and all of a sudden, there's a power blackout. And the screens go dark. And the devil's going, oh, damn, you know. And the power comes back on, and Jesus hits a button, and up comes his program, and the devil says, what? I mean, I lost everything when the power went out. I looked at God the Father and said, how come he's got his stuff and I don't have mine? And God looked down and said, Jesus saves. <laughs> anyway, okay, so is Kurzweil just, you know, a lone guy out there in the wilderness? Well, uh, here's another guy, uh, the Russian billionaire Dmitry Itzkov. He's got what he calls the 2045 project. Uh, he's expecting that we will have a, a total map of the connectome of the neurons in the human brain. Um, and he thinks, you know, by the time 2045 comes around, when he'll be the ripe old age of 65, um, that'll be the good time for him to port his brain up to a computer and go on living there. By the way, Kurzweil also now gives 2045 as the date when we'll probably be able to do this kind of uploading. I think these guys are, are wildly optimistic. Um, Kurzweil used to give 2025, but you know, uh, whenever, it, as it got a little close, he was like, I better push that out a little bit. Let's make it 2045. Um, and you might say, okay, these are the dreams of some pretty wild futurists. Um, but some pieces of this dream are not that wild. Um, we have, you know, here two projects in the United States, uh, the $3 billion uh, Brain Initiative Project that was initiated in 2013 under President Obama. Um, in the EU, a 1.2 billion euro uh, human brain project. Both of them are kind of going from different directions, but looking at this question of mapping the human brain. 
And their feeling is that uh, what Francis Collins did for the human genome, with the Human Genome Project, we can now do with the human brain. Um, and the idea here is that you start with matter, you start with something physical, the brain, figure out its structure, and then we can reverse engineer that structure in a computer, transfer the information from the brain to the computer. Francis Crick is one person who um, believed that we are essentially just information. He writes, you, your joys, your sorrows, your memories and your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. You're nothing but a pack of neurons. Okay. Uh, well, suppose this is true. Um, this kind of brings us then to our second question. How close are we? Um, you know, we, we map the human genome in 10 years. How close are we to mapping the mental connectome? And what might still be standing in our way? So here's question two. How close are we? Well, it's complicated. It turns out this is a job that is much more complicated than the Human Genome Project was. Um, we've got on the estimate of 80 to 90 billion neurons. Each of those neurons can be connected to thousands of other neurons. But it's worse than that. They don't stay connected to certain neurons, there's a lot of plasticity to the brain. In other words, the connections in your brain are continually changing. Through your experiences, whenever you learn something new, when you forget old things, when you go out and have a couple of beers, okay, the connections are changing. Some connections are lost, new connections are formed. Okay. We also know that tasks are distributed. And so it's not quite so easy to say, ah, okay, this neuron's doing that. Okay. Now, of course, with the human genome, it's not that easy either to say, oh, this gene's doing that, and that gene's doing this. Same thing in the brain. And the brain is pretty good at fixing things. So that, that, that we find that many people, when they suffer a, uh, an accident, uh, an aneurysm, a problem in certain parts of the brain, other parts of the brain will eventually take over what was happening in that brain. So while we do know that certain regions of the brain are related to certain things, um, the brain is a lot more flexible. Uh, and other regions can take on the task. Okay. So it's a complicated task. But wait, there's more. I always wanted to be able to say that. Um, because even if we map the neurons themselves, there's the whole role of the neurotransmitters that goes on inside the brain. In other words, our neurons, when they're connected, aren't physically connected to each other. There's a gap. Signals are sent across that gap with neurotransmitters. Um, we know how important these neurotransmitters are when we see people with diseases like Parkinson's, which my father died of, um, and the neurotransmitters are, are no longer you know, circulating in the same volume that they were before. But then it gets even more complicated than that. While we're talking about neurotransmitters, well, it turns out 90% of your serotonin is not in your brain, it's in your gut. Okay? As are 100 million neurons. So if we are going to map a human being's neuronal structure, well, maybe we better go further than the brain, and we'll also need to map the neuronal structure of the gut. But wait, there's more. Now we've got the microbiota in the gut. And we are only now finding out how important a healthy bacterial system, a healthy microbiota is, and how much influence the microbiota can have on the brain. How people without a healthy microbiota can be um, not very uh, 
well, but depressed. They can, it can cause depression, anxiety, um, and a healthy gut, a healthy microbiota can lift people out of depression and anxiety. So we've got a lot of mapping to do. It isn't just the brain. It's not simple. And it's not just one mechanism. It's a whole ecosystem that is making us what we are. Now, you might argue, and it has been argued by some, that they say, well, OK, yeah, I mean, the gut, it's got neurons, it's got the microbiota. It basically, those things deal with emotion. Um, we don't need emotion. They say, OK, it's kind of your second brain, but let's go on to the next slide. OK, can we do without emotion? Uh, and you still have intelligence, you know? So maybe at least with an artificial intelligence, we don't need that good part. Well, not really, OK? At least you're not going to have a human intelligence. You have a Vulcan-type intelligence, if some such thing exists, with only the connectome of the brain. But not a human-type intelligence, um, because emotion is extremely important to who we are. And it's important for a couple of reasons. I'm going to mention some now. I'm going to mention more later. But right now, uh, I would just refer you to the work of Antonio Damasio, who has looked at people who have had brain injuries where they have lost large parts of their ability to feel emotions. And what he finds is, without emotion, they also lose volition. And you can look at this. I, I tend to look at this as the buffet counter problem. If you don't really want something, how are you going to figure out what to take? How are you going to figure out what to do? I mean, emotion, wanting, actually underlies volition. So Damasio has found that many people who, when they lose their, this ability to, to feel an emotion, also lose much of their will to act. OK? Now, there's a third problem. And this is the big ontological question. Suppose I, they do map the brain connectome. And suppose they find a way to transfer, you know, to figure out what my brain connectome looks like and rebuild that with circuitry. It still raises the question, would it be me? I want to approach this question in three ways. OK, the first is a quotation here um, from uh, let's see if I can find the right page here. Okay. Um, Juan Enriquez, manager director of Excel Venture Management, and I have that one up here. If it turned out that all data erases upon transplant, it could happen. That knowledge is unique to the individual organism. In other words, that there is something innate and individual to consciousness, knowledge, and intelligence then simply copying the dazzlingly complex connectome of brains into machines would likely not lead to an operative intelligence. OK, so here's the first question. Even if we could copy my connectome, would it be operative? How would we make it operative? Is there some way you, you flip a switch and it suddenly comes online and becomes operative? In what sense? We have no idea. OK. Um, Thinking again in another way. Suppose you're going into the lab to upload your brain. OK, so I don't know what. They put you in some kind of a machine, you know, probably connect all kinds of sensors to you, whatever. Uh, figure out what your connectome looks like. Then they disconnect the sensors and they say, OK, great, Dr. Hirschfeld, we got you now. Bye. I mean, I'm still going to be here. You know, what will be in that machine will be a doppelganger. Um, you know, something that has my memories, um, my experiences. But of course, from that moment on, we are going to diverge like that. You know, we're going to have completely different experiences because we're going to have a completely different body. And, you know, at that point, which is me? Am I the person that walks out of the lab? Or is that me, you know, somehow in that machine or in that robotic body that is provided for that machine? And then, 
what does that say about the self? Are there now two Noreens? You know, what is the self? Is, do we have unique selves? You can even go a step further and say, if we're able to upload our brains, then here's a question. At what age are you going to upload your brain? Are you going to do it at 15 when you know everything? You know? <laughs> Are you going to do it at 25 when your mental powers, your mathematical abilities are at their height? Or are you going to say, no, I'm going to wait until 60 when I've had a whole lifetime of experiences behind me. Don't wait too long, you know? Um, so, oh, what if I do it? Say, oh, well, let's be safe. Let's do it at all these ages. Now, which one is me? Okay, am I all of those? Uh, this is a question, the question of the self. Do we have a unique self, or would we now be capable of having multiple selves? Okay, so this brings me to the third part. What does Christianity have to say about the nature of the self? and whether bodies matter. Well, our bodies give us continuity over time. Our bodies provide the locus of our intelligence, how we learn and how we remember things. And our bodies provide the locus for relationship. They allow us to feel. Okay? If we take a look at the biblical tradition, um, and many of our speakers have mentioned this question of the image of God that comes up in Genesis 1 in which we were created. This image of God has not been understood in a single way by theologians throughout history. They have been, it has been understood by the earliest theologians as following Aristotle with the idea that we are reasoning animals, that we have these brains that have the capacity for consciousness, that have the capacity to reason, and as he heard in our worship service, the capacity to do the mathematics to understand this wonderfully varied and complex world. But theologians in the 20th century have stepped away from saying no, it's our ability to reason. And they have gone in two different directions. The biblical scholars have moved towards saying it's in our, what we do, how we act, that if you go back to the Genesis text, right after it says we were created in God's image, it says what? That we were given dominion over the world. And so biblical scholars say, oh, let's look at this juxtaposition. We are God's vice regents on earth, acting in God's stead. It is what we do, through what we do, how we act, that we image God. Now the Protestant theologian Karl Barth goes even in a different direction. And he says, well, as Christians, we image a triune God. So he reads the Genesis 1 story where God says, let us make man in our image, not as God talking to a heavenly court of angels, but as a trinity, in a sense, talking. And as a God who embodies relationship in God's very self, saying, we're going to create in our image, we image God then when we are in relationship either with each other or vertically with God. And Bart also said, look at how it also says, you know, um, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and then says male and female, he created them. And so Bart again sees this idea of relationship, and in the male and female, this idea of the closest, most bonding loving relationship as being the image of God in ourselves. Um, so, if we look, for example, at what Bart writes, he says, in God's own being and sphere, 
there's a counterpart, a genuine but harmonious self-encounter and self-discovery. Humans are the repetition of this divine form of life. So, is it intelligence, agency, relationship? Well, in a sense, our self is made up of all of these. That, that we have all three of these that make up who we are as a person. And it even goes a step further. When you think about intelligence, when you think about how a child acquires learning, it's in response to an environment. Intelligence doesn't exist. Learning doesn't exist outside of an environment and outside of relationship. How do children learn? It's already been mentioned by some of our speakers that children aren't getting the chance to learn as much if mom is pushing the pram down the road and looking at this at the same time. That the child learns because the mother is talking to the child, because they're developing this intimate relationship. Children learn from their play. Think about how much a child is learning when they play in a sandbox and interact with the environment. They're, they're learning about gravity, they're learning about um, material densities, flow, all sorts of things that they're learning. And even much of our intelligence, much of our cultural intelligence, is held as a culture. It's not held individually, but it's held by all of us together. And I've got the picture of the hammer there. Um, John Haugeland writes, think of how much knowledge is contained in the traditional shape and heft of a hammer, as well as in the muscles and reflexes acquired in learning to use it. Though no one need ever have thought of it. Multiply that by our food and hygiene practices, our manner of dress, the layout of buildings, cities, and farms. To be sure, some of it was explicitly figured out, at least once upon a time, but a lot of it wasn't. It just evolved that way because it worked. Yet a great deal, perhaps even the bulk of the basic expertise that makes human intelligence what it is, is maintained and brought to bear in these physical structures. It is neither stored nor used inside the head of anyone. It's in their bodies and even more out there in the world. So once again, bodies matter, okay? just for intelligence. How we gain intelligence through interacting with an environment, through relationship with each other, how we hold and use intelligence corporately through relationships with each other. So, here's kind of a case study or a question that I'd like to pose from the Christian perspective. Love, according to Jesus, is the sum of all the law. When he was asked, you know, what's the most important thing in the law? It was to love your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and to love your neighbor as yourself. So the question that I would ask is, if we're in a machine or even in a, in a body of silicon, would this impact our ability to love? Well, in some ways, obviously, it would. Um, Michio Kaku, the futurist and physicist, has said, look, if you are given a choice between high-tech or high-touch, which would you choose? Which do most people choose? I mean, is Skyping your loved one every bit as good as holding them in your arms? Nah, okay, you know. We, we like the high-touch world. Is seeing a picture of the Taj Mahal or even a, a 3D hologram of it as good as going there and seeing the actual place? No. You know, I want to go there. Um, be there. So even though we think, oh yeah, you know, it's all really just information, we're, we're high-touch beings. Touching matters. Okay? Um, but how about empathy? Okay, empathy is a three-stage process. 
Okay, it's um, according to Simon Baron Cohen, our ability to identify what someone else is thinking and feeling and to respond with an appropriate emotion. Okay, so there are three stages to this. Okay, recognition and response. Can a computer do those? Sure. At least we're getting there. Okay, facial recognition programs are coming along where computers can start to recognize the expression on someone's face and say, oh, that looks like anger, and that looks like happiness. Response, sure. We can give a robotic sort of response either through an avatar uh, and the expression on the avatar's face. We can give uh, a response in a robot with um, like some of the cute little MIT robots. Uh, kismet, you know, the ears will droop and the eyes will kind of get sad. Um, but what about that middle stage, okay? To respond with an appropriate emotion. In other words, do we have to be like Bill Clinton who said, I feel your pain? You know, uh, do we have to feel it? Well, that depends. What is emotion? So let's take a quick look at that. Does emotion need a body? According to the psychologist Jerome Kagan, emotion is a four-stage process. Perception of a stimulus, change in feeling that is sensory, appraisal, and response. Okay, so if we think again about a computer, perceive a stimulus, sure. Um, respond, sure. Appraisal, sure. We can write programs to do the appraisal. But what about that number two? Change in feeling that is sensory. Okay, without a body, that part's going to be pretty tough. And notice that that one comes before appraisal. Well, think about your emotions. They do, right? Um, if you think about, uh, you're out on a hike, um, maybe out in the beautiful Sierra Nevada, and you hear a rustling in the underbrush. Okay, your heart is going to start beating up very fast, you know, your mouth will get dry before your brain has a chance to go, uh-oh, wildcat in the brush, you know. Um, the appraisal comes later. Many of our words for emotions actually come from physical bodily responses. The word greed comes from grasping, something physical. Uh, the Latin word timor, fear, is related to the Latin root for trembling. Okay, the Latin word for anger actually comes from a grinding of the teeth. I didn't know that one. Um, so it's that physical response that we've named our emotions from. Now it turns out that there are people who actually don't have this physical response. Okay, who perceive a stimulus, appraise it mentally, and give a response. And here's an outline from the DSM. These people have a lack of remorse, a lack of empathy, a lack of anxiety because they don't have that feeling, that clenching of the gut. Um, they tend to be manipulative. Uh, what do we call these people? Sociopaths, exactly. So, without that middle stage of an emotion, yes, you can calculate the right response, but would we all become sociopaths without a body? You know, functional sociopaths in that, in that sense. Um, I think that's a real possibility. And, you know, on a slightly lighter note from the sociopaths, we think bodies don't matter. Gosh, we just had World Emoji Day. Why in the world do we pepper our text with emojis if we don't think the body matters? So I think it turns out that Christians were onto something when they said we believe in the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. Now I think a lot of Christians are functional dualists. And they talk about, yeah, well, when I die, my soul will leave my body and go to heaven. That is actually not Christian teaching. 
Christian teaching is that there will be a resurrection of the body. As Paul says, it will be a new body. It will be a somewhat different body. But if Jesus is the firstborn of the resurrection, we know that it won't be all that different. After Jesus was resurrected, he was still, he still looked human to people, even though they did have a little trouble recognizing him. And he did have this uncanny way of appearing in rooms with locked doors. Um, so obviously there were some differences here between our body and that body. But as Christians, we really believe that the soul, this is health, is a union of soul and body, a union of mind and body, and that these do not separate and that they will not be separate even in the resurrection. A second way in which Christians have affirmed the body, obviously, is through the incarnation, in which Jesus came and sanctified our bodily nature by taking it on himself. And again, as you heard in our worship service, there were Gnostics who said, well, Jesus' body wasn't really like our bodies. He didn't really suffer and feel pain. This was rejected by the church fathers. There were Docetists who said, well, Jesus' body wasn't really a human body. It just looked like one. You know, and I think of that sort of as like computer scientists are saying, well, maybe we'll all sort of be in holograms. We'll just look like human bodies. But the church fathers rejected that. They called all of this heresy. They said, no, the incarnation was in a real body. And a body that is susceptible to pain and suffering. And this uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky, I think, says it very well in saying that um, he believed, now let me get the exact quote here, if I can find it on my page, here it is. Pain and suffering are always inevitable for a large intelligence and a deep heart. The really great person must, I think, have great sadness here on earth. And what I like about that quotation is that already he is linking deep intelligence with a deep heart. That these go together. Long before we have, you know, Kagan and Simon Baron Cohen and all the work on emotion, we have Dostoevsky recognizing that you don't have deep intelligence without emotion and a deep heart. Now, there is also one other concern that theologians have. We'll just bring up this picture. Uh, with the idea that we could upload our brains. And that is a fear that this will make us devalue the natural world even more than we have already devalued it ourselves. That if we could live in cyberspace and we can form cyberspace to be whatever we want, why well, care about the natural world? Who needs it? Okay. Other theologians worry that it will also devalue women. Because if we are going to live forever, or if we can, in a sense, have progeny by just copying our brains, or by just making new connectomes, you know, the way many artificial intelligence people are saying, let's approach artificial intelligence by saying, okay, we're going to map the human connectome, then we reverse engineer it, and then we could design our own progeny uh, with their own connectome. It doesn't have to be our connectome. We, we make a new one um, the way we want. Well, then, do we need procreation? Do we need sex? Well, as it turns out, Ray Kurzweil and some of the others say, oh, yeah, we're still going to have sex. Don't worry. You know, you're not going to lose that. Um, because sex all happens in the mind, so we'll just stimulate the right parts of the mind. But this is sex for mere self-gratification. This is not the relational kind of uh, relationship that we have in the body. So it's something very different. Okay, this brings me to my last point. I'll be brief on this one. It's like kind of a coda here. If we can't live in cyberspace full-time, how about living in cyberspace part-time? Well, a lot of us are doing that already. Okay? 
Um, how many of you play video games? I do. Okay. Um, most of our kids do. Okay. And in a way, that is a part-time living in cyberspace. A 2017 Pew study showed that uh, nearly all young Americans, 94% of them, play video games. Okay. Um, does the world of video games bring up any of the problems we've already talked about? Well, I think it does. And I'm just going to point out two of them. Okay. One is the problem with relationship with the natural world. You know, if kids are spending all their free time here, typing away in front of a screen, are they out there learning about the natural world and learning to love it and to appreciate it? Carl Pope describes what is lost. In losing our contact with the natural world, we are losing something precious. In a way, we are losing part of what it means to be human. We evolved in nature dependent on its rhythms inextricably connected to other living things. Playing outside every evening until called home by parents in falling darkness, we develop a sense of our human community as part of a wider natural world. American children are losing that connection. So that is my first concern. My second concern, we become who we are. We take on the values that we take on. We learn about the world through the stories that we tell. Through the stories we tell about ourselves, through the stories we tell about our world, through the stories we teach to our children. Why do we send our children to Sunday school? To hear the stories. The stories that have made up our faith, that have made up our life. And so now I ask you, when our children are spending, for some of them, up to, you know, 20 hours a week, that's like a half-time job, playing video games, what stories are they being told? Well, many of the backstories in first-person shooters are stories about revenge. They're stories about a lone actor in a hostile world. They are not Christian stories. And so when we spend our time, even part time, in cyberspace, we're spending our time in a world where we are teaching ourselves, where we are teaching our children stories that may not be the stories we really want to teach. And I think it's very hard to have an in game and an out game ethic. Most of my students tell me, oh, that's okay. I know it's a video game, and my ethic in the video game is to kill as many people as I can, but, you know, I, I don't feel that way in real life. And I say, well, but that story's getting in there. That story's getting in your head. And no, I don't think you're going to go out and become the next school shooter. Okay? But I do think in some very subtle ways, you may be learning about competition rather than cooperation. You may be learning about uh, quick reaction time instead of thinking things over, instead of calming down before you uh, talk to other people, instead of responding, instead of reacting. So I want to give the final word to Reinhold Niebuhr. And this is, I think, Niebuhr's word to Kurzweil and Itzkoff and all the others who are looking at the human future as being a future in cyberspace. And he writes, the Christian hope of the consummation of life and history is less absurd than alternate doctrines which seek to comprehend and to affect the completion of life by some power or capacity inherent in man or in his history. I don't think that we are just information. I don't think we are just the connectome in our brains. I don't think we're even just the connectome in our brains and our guts and our microbiota. We are a soul attached to a body. We will always be that 
Yes, it's a body that feels pain and suffering, and our God felt that pain and suffering right along with us, and that's what it takes to be a self. Thank you. Questions before lunch? So over here first. So that's pretty interesting. Um, so is heaven the outer space? <laughs> so I've, I've had several friends and close relatives that have gone through out of body experiences uh -huh. and they could actually visualize themselves things below <coughs> above. Uh -huh. Is that an uploading experience to the after space? Well, yeah, an out-of-body experience. The question is, um, would people have out-of-body experiences, is that a sort of uploading of the brain to an after space? And it would seem like uh, out-of-body experiences could um, be evidence against everything I've just said that when someone has that experience, they have this, this feeling of themselves as disconnected from their body. Um, and I'm not an expert in those experiences. You know, I, I've certainly read about them. Uh, I, I do know that a person, you can actually stimulate such an experience in a person um, by uh, by stimulating certain regions of the brain, uh, regions that govern our sense of space and locality and our feeling of self. Um, so it might be that that, that, that is simply um, a temporary blip in the brain where that particular region is not working properly. But I know that those experiences of being out of body feel very real to the people who experience them. Um, they, they don't actually fit with the traditional idea, though, that we are an embodied creature and that we will be embodied in the afterlife. Uh, maybe it's less the after space than a transitional space. Yes, there, right there. Right, praise the plumbing principle. Thanks for a uh, really consistent analysis this evening and lots of things to think about. Um, I'm interested in your triad of uh, intelligence, agency, and relationship. And uh, what does suggest that maybe relationship is primary and that there's some kind of stratification of the others? Yes, he said, uh, with that triad of intelligence, agency, and relationship, he'd like to suggest that relationship is primary to the other two. And I agree with you completely. Um, when, when I think about the image of God, I tend to, in fact, I'm writing a new book on artificial intelligence and authentic relationship, and basing it completely off of Karl Barth's idea of what makes an authentic relationship and why relationship is the way in which we image God. So I, I tend to be Barthian on that question. So I agree with you. I believe relationship is primary. For one thing, we all have varying degrees of intelligence. And, and you would hate to say, oh, well, that the more intelligent person is more in God's image. No. OK. And we have varying degrees of agency. And the same thing, many, many times that, that agency, we are hindered from having agency through no fault of our own. Um, again, you know, is the person who lies in a hospital bed uh, and doesn't have that much agency um, less uh, a vice regent of God on earth? And I would say no, because they are still in relationships. Relationships with others, relationships with God. Yes, The problem I'm having with grasping any of this is it seems to me to be this when you use the word cyberspace, uh, it, it brings to me uh, a Cartesian dualism that, that, that corresponds to mine uh, as we have it. And where I'm having difficulties is, is there is no cyberspace in that sense 
all of the places we would have to upload something uh, are going to be physical mm -hmm. and bodily in some sense. So it seems to me like it's more a problem of embodying cyberspace mm -hmm. than it is worrying about us. Yes, he said, you know, when we talk about cyberspace, there is no place called cyberspace. You know, cyberspace is, in a sense, an, an illusion that's on multiple computer servers. And so there is a physicality to it. And, of course, this is one of the reasons. I, I look at someone like Kurzweil and his dream that we could upload our mind and therefore achieve immortality, in a sense, well, no. It won't be immortality. It could be more time, but eventually you got to replace those servers, right? Well, eventually our sun's going to go nova and all the servers are going to be, poof, gone, you know? And so he's looking at immortality as just more time. You know, in the Christian understanding, that's not what it is. It's not just more time. Um, so yeah, we think of cyberspace as, wow, we've escaped the physical, but of course, we ultimately haven't escaped the physical, you know, it's the, the feeling of escape is an illusion made by physical machines that are still right here. There was another one back there. Yes. I would like to, uh, again, raise a question about, you know, is, is there in fact a dualism and some of these people who have talked about, you know, uploading our brain or our soul cyberspace that refer to the phenomenon that many people experience when they're in a near-death experience that they saw their whole life go before, you know, go flash before their eyes, you know, in two seconds or something. It's, you know, some of these people have suggested, oh, well, that, you know, your soul's ready to be uploaded somewhere. <laughs> you have any uh, comments about that? Okay, again, in the end of life experience, people see their whole life go before them, and you could say, wow, that was their brain file. You know, like Francis Crick, your, your file of all your memories and experiences, and now it's being uploaded to a, to a different thing. Um, maybe, uh, but of course the Christian interpretation would still be, well, it's being uploaded to a new body. It's not being uploaded to um, silicon, you know, to a computer. Um, I think, though, that when people say their whole life flashed before them, that for many of them that's sort of a metaphor that, uh, you know, highlights past before them that somehow they remembered certain things, certain images that were of extreme importance to them. Um, and again, that points to the importance of the relational because what people generally remember in those moments are the moments of love that they shared with the people that they were close to. We have time for two more, here and then there. Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. So you mentioned earlier that the soul in Christian thought is um, a union between the body and the mind. I was just wondering if you could explain that a little bit more, and also I was wondering how, as Christians, we're also, we have the spirit, um, how that also fits into that concept of the self. Okay, wow. Um, <laughs> in one minute. Yes, so the question is um, to say a bit more about how Christian thought sees us as the union of a body and a soul, and then what about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and how does that fit into this? Um, wow. Uh, if you go back to the Old Testament, um, the idea, you know, in fact, go back to Genesis, you know, and the idea that God breathed the breath of life into this little mud man that he had made, you know, and man became a living soul. Um, there, there's always the idea that we have a body and then we have what animates that body. And you could describe that as the breath, you know, or you can describe that as the spirit, you could describe that as the soul, you can think of that as the mind, 
you know, and in many ways we tend to use these terms all interchangeably. Um, but uh, we have been seen to be a living, you know, man became a living soul when we had both that indwelling breath and that uh, body, that physical body. Now the question of the Holy Spirit that indwells all of us, I'm going to turn to my Quaker background for that one. Quakers talk about the idea of the inner light. And they say, you know, there is that of God in every person. And that in every person you can try as you go through life to speak to that of God in the other person. And I see that as being analogous to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And I do go back then to that Genesis idea that, you know, God breathed our soul into us um, and that there is something of God that we see in the love that we have for each other and for God and that there is that in every person even though in some it shines much more brightly than in others. Last question. Okay, the question would be when Kurzweil and, and, and the others, when you get into this uploaded state, what do they think people are going to do? <laughs> okay, so you get, you get uploaded to the brain. What are you going to do with that uploaded brain? Uh, I think that they think people are going to think. <laughs> you know? Um, I, I, you know, one of the things that I've always thought was amusing is, uh, have you ever noticed that there is not a single woman who has ever espoused this? It's always guys, and you know, it's, uh, forgive me, Ray, kind of nerdy guys, you know, who, uh, who, who are, they think we're going to think. And that that is sort of the, the epitome of being human, although Kurtzwell did go as far enough to say, oh, you know, and we're going to have sex too. So, um, I don't know. Think and have sex. <laughs> but we're going to go eat, right? And that's because we have bodies. And we're going to enjoy them. Thank you.